All right. I don't know what happened there. I'm hoping you guys can find this. I had to start a new session. It looks like the microphone is back live. There was no way to reconnect on that one. So I'm hoping people can find this stream. So I went ahead and just set up a new session because for some reason I could not get it to work under the old session. The microphone died. Not sure why. Um, hopefully this, this uh, session will hold on. Sorry about that, but they don't uh, give you the option of really reconnecting when you have any kind of a glitch. I haven't experienced that before. Yeah, I'm back, John. Uh, I just had to start a new session. It would not let me edit the other one and basically tweak the microphone for some reason. But yeah, I can see that the microphone's working. It's got a display down here. But uh, anyway, um, it's good to be back. It's good to be doing some live sessions. Like I said earlier, we're going to get a schedule going and you know, suggestions are welcome, especially from the members. I picked this time because we already have the premiere that we're doing for members only on Tuesdays, but this will usually be the group rides. And then we have to pick a time to do the live session, maybe Wednesday or Thursday. I may space it out, maybe do the group ride on Tuesday and maybe do the live session on Friday before we ride. It's kind of up in the air at this point so that if you guys have questions, we can discuss that. Hey, Amal, welcome. New money, welcome to the channel. Um, we've gotten a lot of uh, new subscribers over the last month. Um, and people are finding the channel. Uh, YouTube's recommending a lot of the videos. People are finding the channel. We get a lot of feedback from people saying that they like the approach. You know, kind of a no BS approach, no nonsense. I get that a lot in uh, comments from people. And for me, it's easy because that's just how I am. I mean, you know, just cut to the chase. Hey, Marcus, welcome. And so it's easy because one guy came today. He said, I think he just found the channel and he said that he liked the fact that what I'm talking about, it's clear that I live it. I didn't read it in a book and just pass it on. And yeah, I mean, I don't do everything, but even if I do find something in the book, I usually test it out and lay it. I think what he means is the style, the practicality and giving good examples. I think that that's kind of what I got from it. As so I told him, yeah, it's just, it's easy because that's kind of just how I roll per se. So it's, I don't even have a script when I make the videos. It's like, I'm just me and the camera, we're just talking. And so it's, it comes naturally. But I like the fact that he provided that feedback because I think you learn better when you can apply what you're being told as opposed to taking notes and you can't practically use it. So I like to give people something they can use on the next ride and try it out and so forth. So, you know, with winter coming and so forth, I've been uh, boning up on the retro jerseys. This is another one here. I got this from the same place called Pulling Turns. This is the jersey that Greg LeMond wore, a replica of it, when he won his world championship in 1983. Uh, this Renault was one of the sponsors for the U.S. team. And so I got a replica of that. I like the materials they use. You can see it's breathable here and on the sides. Same as the other one I had. And I also got a Koss jersey. Some of the teams that I used to watch when I was new into cycling in the late 80s and so forth. So it just evokes a lot of memories. I got another jersey that's similar to this, but it's the current U.S. team jersey. Uh, you know, I, I'm into the U.S. stars and stripes because uh, I've lived here most of my adult life. And uh, this country means a lot to me and it represents, you know, one of the most stable democracies we've had. And, you know, those of you who've been keeping up with what's going on, we're at a turning point where we've got to make sure we keep our democracy stable and going. So I'm into my U.S. mode. So I got two of these jerseys with the stars and stripes to wear over the winter in some of the rides. Let's see. Marcus says he's become a big fan. He thank you for the insight. So much. Yeah, you're welcome, Marcus. I mean, I'm glad you found the channel. Um, it's pretty much a birth of... I was helping people locally that we meet on rides. And then I met my buddy Paul in 2016. And I noticed right away that his fit was off and I helped him. And then he suggested, hey, man, you know, 
I've been spending money at performance. We, we had a, a bicycle store here called Performance Bike. They're now they're online. I think Nash Bar, they're all related. But he went there and they, they had him buy gel saddles. He was just buying, buying, as opposed to fixing the discomfort he was having. And so he didn't know that I did fit. But I could tell when I met him on the ride that the bike was not fitted to his body. And so after I fitted his bike, he liked it so much. He was like, no, you got to put this on YouTube somehow because he said I was giving him too much information for him to be able to handle the volume. And so I started the channel at the point, you know, I wasn't sure much about YouTube. I just had a YouTube account that I used to look up things. And I started and it just took off. And I'm glad I did because now it's like it's helped a lot of people. I have a lot of people all over the world that do remote fits with me. I had a guy in Pakistan that did a remote fit. We did it like midnight his time, which was 2 p.m. here. I think they're like 10 hours ahead. And if it weren't for this channel, he wouldn't have found me. And then I've had people drive from Florida to come here for fits and so forth. So it's a little humbling, you know, and it, it's kind of nice to see, but it's humbling the fact that these videos really show them that I know what I'm talking about. And they're like, yeah, they're like, well, we're not that hands on. I want you to do it. And they'll come here for that. So it's been really good, you know, getting into that. So I really enjoy the, the videos like a labor of love, especially the group rides. That's where I spend the most time. That's the videos that take the most time. And I'm glad I do it the way I do it because it, for us, I like cycling. I used to watch cycling on YouTube and you don't know what's going on in those rides. And so I wanted to do it to where I would draw people in. Yeah. So Marcus said he used to work at performance in the DC area. <laughs> he watches the ride videos. Yeah. So the, the ride videos on YouTube that you see from other places, now some of them are a little better what they're talking about. They're, they're talking about the power and it's like racing and so forth. A little different, but there's so many ride videos, you just see people riding. You got one view. You don't know what's going on. You don't know who they are, you know, what they're thinking or anything. And it just does not engage you enough. And so I decided that if I were going to do a video, before I even started a group ride, so I used to wear on my helmet and so forth, I, it felt, I felt like it would make more sense instead of me just sitting in the studio and making videos and instructing. I felt like we show what's happening on the road. We're actually riding and explain why we do what we do. It doesn't mean that it's the one way to do everything, but at least we're explaining why we're doing it at that moment. And I think that involves people to where they're like, oh, okay, so that's why this happened. I think that's why it's popular. They're not short videos. I try to keep it around 90 minutes or less, but I want to tell a story. I don't want to just be like pieces of clips with no continuity. And so that's what it's about. So where you can watch it on a trainer. I mean, I watch them myself. I, I put them together and people think that it's not boring. When I'm watching the premiere, it's my first time seeing the finished product. Because when I'm working on them, I work in pieces. It's like you're baking a cake and you get the pieces of the recipe, but you don't see the whole cake till it comes out of the oven. It's the same thing for me because I work on the, what they call the timeline. Those of you who work with films and you're working with clips and pieces and you're putting music together. Somebody came this week and said that the, the music was too loud in certain places and they couldn't hear me. And they were right. I went and I said I would check because I always have to try to keep an open mind. And I went back and I checked and some of the tracks were kind of loud. And so I've made some adjustments to where hopefully it will be about the same. And so, you know, it's a, I always read the comments and I look, you know, some people will come and say, change the music. Some guy just came, new guy, change the music. Well, change the music to what? And why should I change the music? So you, you, those kind of comments I have to ignore because... They're not constructive. You know, I remember um, maybe a year or so ago, somebody said you shouldn't be talking, no narration, no conversation, just people writing, which is what YouTube has. And what they don't understand, those videos you see, people just film with the camera and they just dump footage. They're not putting any time in editing and so forth. And so, of course, I didn't listen to that because I, I kind of know why I'm doing this. And I, it's really instructional. I don't want people just watching us ride. I want them to know what's going on. And so, yeah, so that's kind of good when I get constructive feedback and I see that, oh, yeah, this is because I kind of have an idea of what I want to communicate. Instead of just making videos in the studio, the, the group rides have a lot of information for those who are willing to invest the time. It takes time.
Let's see here. Uh, Ali Sal Sulai. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Sulaiman. Sulaiman. He said, what's up, legends? <laughs> Look around says, uh, just getting into cycling and loving your channel. You're welcome. Look around. I appreciate it. Um, welcome to cycling. Cycling is a lifetime sport. I personally just love riding my bike. Simple end of story. That's why I'm into cycling. I love to ride my bike. And I'm sure that's true for almost everybody. That's the reason I cycle. So, and, and I'm, I have the personality, if I'm going to do something, then I might as well do it really well. It doesn't mean you're going to go win the world championship, but what it means is you're going to get the most out of your God-given talents. That's what this channel is about. So that you understand how to prepare yourself. You understand how to... Not be a Boy Scout necessarily. I've been called that jokingly by some of the people we ride with. But you need to be able to handle incidentals. Like, you know, you have a flat. You shouldn't have to call for a ride all the time. You know, you should be able to get yourself home. That, that's what I mean. Understand everything involved. And when you're new to the sport, it helps to have a place you can go to to find that. Alex Ray says, Eldred, can you talk us through your choice of bikes? Why steel over carbon or tie or aluminum? Let's see here. I definitely learned some easier your rides. All the way from Trinidad, Colin Edwards. Welcome. <laughs> so, okay, let's talk about bikes since we're talking cycling, and that, that's a good topic. I want to make it clear. I have nothing against carbon. They're just very expensive. <laughs> okay. And so, I mean, you know, because uh, let me put it this way. Well, let me be fair. Um, not all of them are expensive. But I have expensive tastes. I'm one of these guys when you go into the store, everything that catches my eye tends to be high dollar. I hope you all can relate. You know what I mean? You can walk into a store and they got stuff from zero to a thousand dollars. I tend to look at things that are like 850 and up in that scenario. So for me, if I'm looking at carbon bikes, I'm gonna be looking like the at the BMC. You know, you don't want to talk about the team machine and the you know, the top specialized and all that kind of stuff. And, and uh, I've had carbon before. I had the uh, Calfi, which is a very, you know, Calfi and Kestrel are the guys who really, I believe Kestrel was first. They really kicked off the carbon craze. And Calfi right now is a company that's established with carbon. They'll even repair your carbon frames, regardless of what brand it is, if you strip it and send it to Calfi. They did that for my buddy, Alan. So Calfi is not a slouch, you know, it was a good bike. But for me, after a few years of riding that Calfi, it didn't feel alive to me. I don't know what happened. Maybe it was just the way it was made and how I got it. It wasn't really a true custom per se. And maybe they just, at that point, whatever materials, car, you know, the, the formulation of the carbon fibers they were doing at that point, you know, nowadays, I'm sure. And that, this was like 2002, you know, when I stopped racing, I wanted to get some bikes and that was what you know, I, I, I started with. So I wasn't that crazy about it. And then I got into, I also had a titanium frame that was kind of dead. You know, they, they use heavy tubes just so I guess they wouldn't have warranty issues. So I currently have steel because that's what I raced on for the most part. I have it called Nago. I didn't do a lot of racing on called Nagos. I just always liked called Nago frames. We use like Pinarello you know, some of the Bianchi frames of the day. And they used to have other frames like Geos and different things, but it was always steel when we were racing. It was very common. Um, will I get another, a carbon frame? Maybe in the future. I'm not anti-carbon, but, um, you know, it's kind of like N plus one. I've got three now. So the next one will be plus one. That's kind of the way you have to look at things. But what I'm trying to get to is that to get a carbon frame, I don't want to just get any carbon frame. I want to get something that would fit me really well and really the, the high, highest quality carbon because you don't buy a frame every day. So I want to get a good one that I won't get tired of, if that makes sense. So um, to review your question, you said, well, why steel over carbon? Yeah, so I love the feel of steel. I also love the feel of titanium. The ti I have a titanium bike. That's the orange bike you see in there. I ride it from time to time. 
It's very lively and very, very competitive when it comes to carbon. And it all depends on the builder. It was built by Kish, and he did a really good job in lightening the tubes where it needed to be. I made some videos about it. Uh, if you search under the frame, just say frames, you will see them in there where I talk about it in detail. But uh, yeah, I, I, I will shop for carbons in the future when, when it fits the budget. But right now, it's not in the plan right at this time, you know. But uh, yeah, they make they make pretty lightweight frames. So if you're going to be doing a lot of hilly events, yeah, carbon is really the number one you want to look for for super lightweight stuff. And then tie is pretty close. You can get you can get some really lightweight tie bikes, you know. But it's not just about the weight of the bike. I think it's very important that you make sure your bike fits you, you know, regardless of what kind of bike you get. It needs to fit you. Otherwise, you won't enjoy it that much. So. Um, Steel really is just for the feel. If you're doing really long rides on crappy roads, man, it just really soaks them up. You know, of course, the tires and the, the combination, the kind of tires you use play a different, but there's just something about the feel of steel that carbon's yet to come close to. But there are some really nice carbon bikes out there. You know, the top stuff, they're just a little kind of the, the price kind of crazy, in my opinion. But if you can get, if you know your size and you can get some good used ones, there are some deals to be had. Whether it's eBay or Facebook Marketplace, you can find some really nice frames secondhand and really save a lot of dollars there. And that may be the route, the route I will go because I know what my size is. But then you got to pick a, a, a brand that works for you. For me, I like long top tubes. At least 59 centimeters top two minimum, 59 and a half, close to 60. I like the long top tubes, so I don't have to put a very long stem on it because I need a 72 total reach for me. So, you know, with a 60, I just put a 12 or a 13. I should be good depending on the angle of the stem to get the reach that I need. And that's kind of you need a bike sizing and then you can shop for your bike. So you don't have to buy brand new. But all that will work. Now, with carbon, just be careful. They need a lot of care. You can't beat them up. You can't drop them around and dog them. You know, you got you to take care of them. They need TLC. You can't bang them around because uh, sometimes you can't tell if they're damaged or not. All right. Let's see here. All the way from Trinidad. Yeah. Um, <laughs> he just picked up some tire boots today. That's <laughs> Steel is real. Steven says steel is real. There is a Facebook group called Steel is Real. Somebody invited me to join a while back. I went there and looked at some of their articles. They're always selling components and different things. They seem to, be, they seem to have a lot of activity. So Thomas says, what do you think about Colnago V3 RS? I have not really spent that much time looking at the newer Colnago trimmings that are out there. Um, you know, it's it's just they're always they're always gonna remember they're always gonna be coming up with something new. What you want to focus on is you can't go for the marketing for anything. You want to look at what do you need, what are you in the market for right now? And that that's the way I operate. I keep a reminders list, like those of you who've got, I mean, everybody's got smartphones. Like I've got an, an iOS Apple phone. So in my reminders list, I have a group called cycling. I have a group Velo Harmony for the channel. And what I do is if I'm if I need like if I use my last chain because I keep up with my chain wear because if you don't, you can wear out your cogs. If I use my last chain, I put something on the list, a reminder. I need, you know, call Nago. I mean, Camp Agnolo record or whatever chain. So I don't go for marketing that much unless it's giving me something that's already on my list per se. So if you're shopping for frames and you know you like Colnago and your reason for liking Colnago is because maybe you just love their branding or you like the frame dimensions. For me, for example, yeah, Colnago is one of the, the guys on the short list, list if I were to buy a frame. Cannondale is as well because they make long top tubes. That's the reason that primarily Savello also my thing with Savello in the area where we ride. So many people have them. They're just kind of common because it, like it's one of the local bike shops had a sale a while back and everybody grabbed Savello's. But I also like Cannondale. So you want to go with what's going to meet your need and are you in the market for it? Because otherwise your mailbox, your in mailbox is bombarded with 
marketing stuff every day. Even if you had all the money in the world, where would you store all that stuff? So just buy what you need. Don't focus too much on stuff. Focus on what fits you, what works, but focus on making sure you have enough time to ride your bike. That's important because you can have the best stuff in the world. If you, if you can't ride because you're bo booked up with other things, then you're not going to be able to really make the most of the stuff that you get. <clears throat> Look around says, what are your thoughts on bike trainer usage for training? Um, I think that every rider should have a trainer. And you can decide how fancy you want it to be, whether you want to get the, the thing that's got power. And some people got stuff that will work with apps and Zwip and different things. But even Zwip will work with simple trainers. But, but the, the point is that why do you need a trainer? There's always going to come a time when you're pressed for time. Okay, it takes time to put on all the stuff, you know, jersey, especially now it's winter. The colder it is, you got to wear more crap. It'll take you more time just to wear that stuff. Sometimes it's just better to get on the trainer, turn on a fan, and do a short 45-minute workout if you press for time or if you work late or if you can't sleep. You know, that's always very So, yes, I recommend – everyone I coach, I recommend to get a trainer. In fact, I kind of require it because if you can't train consistently, then I'm not going to see the results when I do your reviews. So, yes, uh, you need a trainer. You just need something reliable. It doesn't need to be fancy. If you're training to power and you already have a power meter on your bike, that's actually pretty good. But some people have trainers that have power meters built in. That would work too. But you don't need a power meter per se to really get a good workout. I mean, you know when you're going hard. And I don't like to invoke power meters and heart rate monitors all, all the time. But people that I coach, I ask that they at least have a heart rate monitor. Reason is there are always times when you're on your bike when you're just rolling. You know, the wind's behind you, slight downhill, and you're not working. And that's why I try to tell people I make the most of my time. I'm used to knowing, I know when I'm not doing anything and then I shift up or, I'm, you know, get the work. Because if I'm working, riding for an hour, I want to get the most out of that hour for whatever zone I'm supposed to be in. So in order to keep yourself in that zone and maximize your training, you need a training tool. That's the reason. I kind of deviated to that because I want to come back to power meters. Without power meters, you have the mercy of the weather. You have the mercy of your work schedule, life schedule. That's always so you need you need a trainer. It's a necessity, in my opinion. If you really want to improve, whatever your goals are, losing weight, getting fitter, whatever. And losing weight and getting fitter kind of go hand in hand. So you need that because you need that consistency. All right. Let's see here. Uh, <clears throat> Zoe Mama is <laughs> Homelander. Dwayne Randolph. Okay, we're back on. What's happening? Though, yeah, I don't know what happened before, but uh, there was a technical glitch. It's it's one of these things. I'm simply using the webcam that YouTube has because it's the easiest thing to use. They have all this software that you can use. The problem is, I'm a techie and I've been testing them. There's a lot of delay. There's a lot of latency, and so with the way we interact here, it wouldn't work for us. I needed something that would be re as real time as possible. The, 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 the other streaming programs, I mean, depending on, you know, they have OBS and different things. They, there's, there's, a, there's a delay, 15, 20 seconds. It makes a difference. And it just, it just seemed kind of glitchy when I tested it. They have other things that are better, but then you, you bear in the expense of subscriptions and all of that. And I, I didn't want to get into all that. So this is a lot simpler. This is the same thing I've been using. It's just a webcam with your FaceTime camera on your I'm using a display, an Apple display camera. So it just works as simple and works great for what we're trying to do because there will be more live streams. Um, my, the members on the channel are growing to the point where when the members post a comment, they will get priority and then the super chats and so forth. That's the long-term plan. And it will have some sessions with just members to where members can just come in and ask me questions. So the channel is growing to the point where we, we have a need for that. So since there was no group ride this week, because I'm, I took the week off, the, even the weekend, to just let my body kind of detrain, and then I'm going to ramp back up starting tomorrow. You always want to take off some time, usually three to five days at the end of your season per se. It helps with your mental and physical recuperation so that you don't feel 
tired of it, sick of it, burnout, whatever. That's that's kind of your in your period periodization training schedule. There should be a week program in there because as we go into fall now with October, it's less on bike work. You're still gonna ride, but there's gonna be more gym and calisthenics and yoga, the other stuff that I do to keep my body really strong and flexible. You incorporate more of that into into your training regimen. You know. All right, let's see here. Uh, <clears throat> Dwayne's asking about the power pod power meter. Yeah, um, I've been pushing that thing because I'm I like testing stuff. Power pod power meter. Let me start this way. If you're somebody who don't have the patience to really configure something, even even if you actually to be fair to the thing, it's not that hard. But let me put it this way: the basic configuration, what I I'm gonna call it out of the box, but there's no such thing. They have different modes of configuration for the power pod. The card that I used in the video was out of the box. You go through. You saw me set it up on my bike. You can decide whatever mount you want. Once you go through that process and you get the yellow light, the problem with that yellow light is it doesn't follow the, the card because there are contingencies, not, not, not bearing on the power pod. The power pod does not know whether you have the Garmin independent speed unit, which is what I have, the speed sensor. Okay. Or what do you have? The GSC-10. The GSC-10 is like a speed slash cadence sensor. It doesn't know whether you have the Wahoo speed sensor. I'm using that as an example. So I went ahead and I read. I went to Velocom and I read all their... They, they have a forum where they, they, they've been supporting people for years. And I spent the time. And you don't have to do that. But I chose to do that. The reason being was I found out through the threads that different brands of speed sensors the signals are not that strong. So the Velo, the Velocom power pod does not work very well with Wahoo speed sensors. I think they should put it in the literature because they, they, they disclosed it in their forum that you put it on there so before people buy it, they can know that, okay, I've got Wahoo. I may have problems setting it up. So you're going to see some people give reviews. Even on Amazon, there were reviews that said, I tried to get it to work. I really tried. It just never worked. Well, the person didn't say what kind of speed sensor they had. I happen to have the Garmin independent uh, speed sensor by itself, which has a strong signal. It picked it up from the back wheel. But even with that, that they recommend that you work with, with it, it took two tries before I got the yellow light. If you watch the video, you saw me. I had to push the button again for four seconds before it went solid yellow. Well, that was not what the instruction said. The instruction said, Push the button for four seconds, get the blinking green, spin your wheel, wake it up, which is already up, but I spun the wheel just in case. And it should have found it and gone to yellow. Well, it didn't find it. What it did, the green light went off. And I pushed the button again. And when it came back on, the yellow light was solid. What it meant is it found the unit, but it did not go yellow for me. It went off. And when I turned it back on, then it went yellow solid. Well, if you're reading the instructions, that's going to throw you off. But, but notwithstanding, once you get it to pair with your speed sensor, getting it on the Garmin head unit is easy. Because once it pairs with your speed sensor, then Garmin recognizes it. When you go and add power, it's there. And you add it. And it stays solid yellow all the time until you do the configuration. The configuration you saw me do is the basic configuration, which means all you do is it's solid yellow. You got it paired. You you went to your head unit. You 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 entered it in the head. Because when it pairs initially, your speed sensor must be paired to the head unit first. Then it pairs to your speed sensor. Well, your head unit doesn't know the power meter at that point, so you need to go in and add the power meter. And once you do it the ID pops up and I called it PPA. Once you've done that now, you go for a ride and it will start counting. As soon as you start riding, you turn it on, it will be solid yellow. You start the ride. It will stay solid yellow and it will start to count one to a hundred. When it hits a hundred, the yellow light goes off. You're done. It's configured. You don't need to configure again unless you remove your speed sensor from the pairing or something like that. And someone came on the channel and said, I had to configure every ride. No, you don't. You shouldn't have to. It's not required. 
It was that configuration you saw on the video that produced the numbers in the ride that I did three weeks ago, I'm, I'm estimating, where you saw all those numbers and they were pretty good. Then I went and read further because someone else came to the channel and said that uh, you, you could increase the accuracy, which is true. So they have a software now. So all of that, if, you, if you're somebody who's just looking for something, you set it, you forget it, that's good enough because it's consistent enough for you to train to. With that configuration, even DC Rainmaker got it to work and track with the strain gauge power meters. He tested it and it's consistent. That's good enough for most people. So for me now, when I'm working on with the power pod, since I'm not riding that much, I'm going to use, I've already set up the Isaac software. There is a software that they have that's free. You can download and you install it. You have to follow their steps because it's a little glitchy. And if you're using Catalina or any of the other things, I mean, I use a Mac, but if you're using Windows, a little different. The, the security thing in Catalina kind of blocks you and you got to go into your preferences and just say, yes, allow. It's kind of like when you download apps that it doesn't know the developer, nothing crazy. But the sequence of the install is critical and they walk you through. I did it. I put it on my older MacBook Air because I didn't want to put it on my main machine to, to start. And it worked flawlessly. Why do you need that software? Isaac software is required if you're going to use more than one bike. And you said, why? Okay, this is what was confusing to me. And I even sent them a note and the guy replied. What happens is this. The unit pairs to your speed um, head unit, but it tracks other things. It also knows that you have a cadence sensor. So even though you're not actively pairing the cadence sensor, when you spin your pedals, to you know you start to ride, it picks up that ID. So while you're using it, this unit is still learning more about you. It learns your wheel circumference, whatever wheel you're using, all of that, without you going into any software, just with the first thing I explained. It learns more about you, your weight, the weight of the bike, all of that. It gathers that slope, all of that friction. So it continues to improve its numbers, even if you don't use the software. Well, it gets to know that bike and you. So when you put it on a different bike, it does not pair because it's still on that bike number one profile per se. You need to change the profile. So if you just took the speed sensor off, thinking that, which is what I had suggested in the video, you got one speed sensor, why not? It should work on the other bike. Well, it's got to be reconfigured again because it doesn't know that other bike, doesn't know what kind of wheels you have and so forth and so on. So they recommend that the cleanest way, if you're using multiple bikes, they have two different sets of software. They have one called Power, I think it's Powerhouse. It, you pay 99 cents for it. It's in the app store. You put it on your phone and you can switch profiles there. I've put that on my phone, but it's not as robust. I prefer to use the Isaac software, which has more stuff in there. So with the Isaac software, you can set up as many. It will take up to four profiles if you have up to four bikes. So you can set them up. You, if you're really into it, you can weigh each bike, put the weights in there and all of that, and it will, it will just clean up the numbers because it continues to learn as you ride. If you change the wheel, it will work with the circumference every time you do a config. So it's recommended that every time you change the components, like the wheels and so forth on your bike, you do a config so you get better numbers. And I think that's what people are misinterpreting to think that you need a config every time. No, you don't. So what I've done so far, I have three bikes. I went into the software over the weekend. I set up the three profiles. I give. I put the bike names there. So the first bike is the blue one, the Lighthouse, the Kish, and the Colnago. I put them in there, and I will go ahead and do what is called the out and back configuration. That is different. That's not the regular one. The out and back configuration, what happens is you have to basically tell the software that you want to do out and back configuration. The normal configuration out of the box that I explained does not require that you go out and back. The out and back configuration says that you need to pick a place where you're not going to be stopping. You're going to ride three minutes out. Then the red light will go off, and then you turn around. The red light will get solid, sorry. Then you turn around and ride three minutes back. Supposedly, that's a more accurate configuration. They call it for best accuracy, and that's what I'm going to do Maybe tomorrow I will configure that for the blue bike and just see how that pans out. But the cool thing about it is even the regular config that you do, it stores it 
it stores all your rides in that unit to where you can download it to the computer and look at your power numbers. It does analysis on left leg, right leg. So those of you who are into balancing and all of that, you can get crazy in that software. I, I look through that stuff and I'm like, there's no way I'm going to be looking at all this stuff. They, they splice and dice the data in so many ways to where you can just go crazy if you into data that much. But I will be using the out and back to see how that compares to the standard config. It's gonna be hard to tell because the standard config was pretty accurate. So what I did learn was that it knows my cadence meter. It had the ID for the cadence meter. It even knows that you're wearing a heart rate monitor. I don't know what it does with the heart rate information, but it registered my heart rate monitor in the profile. I didn't know that till I loaded the Isaac software and went into the config, and then I could see all that data. So without the Isaac software, you don't know what else it's doing other than the display of the slope and wind and all of that that it gives you. I think it's really neat because it gives you the wind. If you got a 10 mile an hour head wind, it basically lets you know you got a negative, you know, it's slowing you down. You're working against the wind and it displays, it has a display for that. So there's a lot more to it than just, you know, uh, sticking it on and running. I think that for, for the most part, if you just use a standard config, it's going to be good. But if you're somebody who want more, then fine. But there are people who are not that into it that they could just use the standard config and be fine. Uh, just be cautious when you're switching bikes. So I asked the guy, I said, okay, what if I don't want the Isaac software and I want to use multiple bikes? And what he said is you need to either use the powerhouse to set those profiles and then if you don't want to use software to manually switch profiles, just let it go to sleep for 20 minutes. It will pick up the new bike after it wakes up. So anytime it exceeds 20 minutes, it goes to sleep. It picks up the new bike. Then my other issue was, oh, it only lasted 12, 12 uh, hours with me. He said, oh, well, when it goes to sleep, it's still using power. Ah, so I started turning it off. And I've gotten it to last more than 12 hours. I'm still tracking that just to make sure. So there's, there's a way you, you push the button five times. And the button is on the side, not on top. They've got the, the little design, the power thing on the top. And you think you push it. No, you push it from the side. You push it five times and that shuts it off completely. It's not sleep mode. It's just off. Okay. So I'm going to be testing whether when you shut it off and it wakes up, does it pick up the new config or only when it sleeps? Those are the kind of things I'm playing with because the, the, the guy wasn't very detailed about it. So, yeah, it works. It, it, it's all up to how deep you want to go. And I, for one, didn't care whether I got a power meter or not. So I've been tracking this thing since maybe 2017 when they did their crowdfunding. I don't have the right date, but that's when they started. And I've been watching and following. It's perfect for me because it does not mess with anything else on my bike. You know, and I like that. I don't like hardware stuff you know stages got their problems you know they, they they break on you i've had people that are frustrated with stages because they stick it on there and it just has its own issues some people get bad batches it happens but this product uh the way they support it is just unparalleled you you get responses from these guys like you're the only customer i haven't had to use them that much i've been on a forum and just chatting on there because there's enough information there that i found everything i was curious about and they have reached the point where they have enough detail in their software to where you can walk through it. So, yeah. So I like it. And I think it's going to be fine. I really just got it to display power numbers on the, the film. But I don't really worry too much about training. When I'm going hard, I know how hard I'm going. You know, it's nice to see numbers from time to time. But that's pretty much all I use it for. All right. So enough about that power pod. Let's see here. Uh, all right. Let's go back up here. Let me see. Okay, I don't see any members there right now. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Chad Visual said, thought of tips on buying a bike during the pandemic. Everything is back ordered till 2021. Safe to buy a pre. Oh, yeah. Pre-owned bike is a great. The first thing you need to do, Chad, is get a bike sizing done. You need to know your size. That's what I was talking about earlier. You need to know how long a top tube you should get. And you need to know your seat tube height, what size frame. Don't go by this medium large stuff. So if you're buying something to use, have the person measure center to center. You know, but get a bike sizing done. We offer that on, on veloharmony.com. Get a bike sizing, know your bike before you buy anything used. 
and just get something that's in good condition. You can tell from the pictures, ask them how long they've had it, why they're selling it. But there are a lot of good deals to have. So that's you know, it doesn't need to be new. There's great bikes out there. A lot of people buy bikes and they move on to another one. They have multiple bikes. They're just thin in the herd. You know, Paul bought his bike, my buddy, bought a white bike, dirt cheap because the guy's wife told him, hey, you got too many bikes. Get rid of Get rid of this one. You're not using it. It was practically new. And he just unloaded it, a Cervelo, you know. So, yeah, different reasons why people unload bikes. So Facebook Marketplace is a good place. I've got a lot of people that have gotten bikes from there, you know. They bring them for me to kind of look over them and so forth. Robert from Plano. Welcome, Robert. So Joe Garwood said, worst cycling-based decision I've ever made. Worst cycling-based decision. Hmm. Hard to say. I guess it'll have to be the context. Worst cycling-based decision. I guess maybe the probably, the probably the independent fabrication frame that I bought because it was the dog. I paid good money for that frame and Never enjoyed it. It was too, it was too dead. My, the titanium frame I replaced with the Kish. Yeah, I would say, you know, it's always stuff, you know. So you got to be careful. Uh, let's see here, Abdal Abdul Khalik. I remember that name. What are your thoughts on rollers? Rollers are great. I used to use rollers a long time ago. I don't have any right now. Um, I use the trainer because I use the trainer to fit people. And so it's just convenient to just use that. Rollers really work your balance um, as well as, you know, they have some resistance now, but I don't think you necessarily have to have resistance. You got your gears. But if you're somebody new to cycling, it really teaches you how to be smooth. That, that's what it's really good for. I was fortunate when I got into cycling, I did a lot of track stuff. So I had fixed gear bikes. That forces you to be smooth, <laughs> you know, so. But yeah, rollers are good, are good to have. Some people prefer rollers to the regular indoor trainers, standard trainers. David, that's good from Germany. Welcome, David. Collins, Colin Edwards said, any tips for heavier muscular guys who find losing weight difficult? Okay. Um, I slow down because losing weight is kind of um, it's kind of a red herring if you think about it. I'll use me for an example. Seven months ago, let's see, this is let's see, March, April, May, June, July, August, September. Seven months ago, I was 93 kilos. I'm currently 85 kilos. So if you do the math, what is that? Eight kilos, 17 pounds thereabouts, if you round. I didn't try to lose weight. I just increased my activity. And since you're saying you're muscular, I'm going to go with this premise. If I do weights... I put on more muscle. So I don't do weights. I stretch. I do military style exercises. Uh, resistance with my body because I, I just get bulky. And you don't, there's certain kind of muscle you put on that you don't need on the bike, especially when the road goes up. So um, if you're having trouble losing weight, I think it has to do with the, the kind of riding you're doing. What it may sound, I don't know anything about what you're doing or what your training program is. But people like you, I usually give them a plan to where I focus more on a lot of heavy stress on the cardiovascular system, high cadence, because you're already strong. We just get you to spin those gears faster. Um, so that I think you need a plan where you're doing a lot of high cadence workouts, Colin. That will drop. That will drop the weight. And stay away from from lifting weights. You can stretch. You can do yoga, calisthenics, whatever. But stay away from the weights. You know, you can look at our plans online. There's the stuff out there. Workouts on there for high speed stuff that will cause you to. You can drop the weight. You can lean out. You know, you just need to increase your volume, your riding volume. Hey Jeffrey, welcome. Jeffrey's one of our members here on the channel. Jeffrey Davis. So, uh, Jose Fajardo, agree with you. Better the carbon frame. Get the right size and right fit always. I find a really expensive bike with Inca Red Fit. Yeah, um, there are a lot of guys with Inca Red Fit. I mean, you guys see it on the, the, the films that we, we make. Uh, the bike doesn't have to be expensive to fit you poorly. I have found in my experience, and it seems to continue all the time, people don't want to invest in fit. What I found is most of the people that compete, almost all of them invest in fit. 
because they find out real quickly that their fit is wrong because when you go to a race and you, you, you're forced to go hard, that's when you find out that your bike doesn't fit you. It's when you're going hard and you start moving around because your body will automatically try to get you in the most optimal position. So if you're not seated in the best spot on that saddle, you start moving towards where your body says you should be. And once you're moving, that means you don't like where you're sitting. They find that out real quickly. Then that's why you get saddle swords and chafing and all of that. So they got to deal with that if, to be successful. Whereas when you're riding casually, yeah, you can get away with a bad fit. You're not really going hard. You're just kind of tooling around. Yeah. You know, and that's what ends up happening. So a lot of people don't find out they have a bad fit till volume increases or intensity increases. We hear people coming to the channel and say, oh, I'm fine until I hit 45 minutes. Then my knees start hurting. Well, it's been there. It's just that at 45 minutes, your body has had enough. You know, and you don't want to mess with a bad fit because you can injure yourself seriously. You know, so, yeah, people need to invest in their fit. That's why my, my one of my, my byline is it all begins with fit. Imagine running a marathon in shoes that don't fit. You're not going to go very far. Uh, let's see here. So David Bertel said, well, Jose, a thousand buck carbon bike is quite the steal. It's not so much what you pay for the bike, David. I mean, it could be a deal, but focus more on it's a lot of these bikes. Why were they built? I've, I've done a video where I talked about the reason why people buy the, the bikes that the pros ride is because at least you taking out the guesswork. That means this bike is most likely done for fast riding or whatever. Not every carbon bike, even if it's inexpensive, is, is necessarily built for the kind of riding you want to do. Because remember, the manufacturers don't know you. So they may have made that bike a little more dense than you needed it to be based on your body type and your riding style. And so, yeah, you got a deal on it. Like I had a Kestrel, you know, I mean, the, the Calfee, and I didn't like it. It felt dead. So, yeah, before I get a carbon bike in the future, I will definitely do a lot of research and make, make sure I get something that's very responsive. I like bikes that when you put the power down, they, they go. You know, That's the way my titanium bike is. It really moves. You can feel it. And the same thing with the light speed. And you know, the Colnago is not going to be the lightest bike, but I tell you what, the feel is unparalleled. That, that's steel. I don't know what, how they did it, but. Yeah, it's not the bike I would take to do a mountain time trial because it's not the lightest thing around. You know, when you're going uphill, weight is actually a detriment. But on regular roads, a few rollers, it's not that big a deal. So, yeah, you want a bike that's comfortable regardless of what you pay for it. All right, let's see here. Uh, <clears throat> Fitness Life says, six foot six and you fit a guy this tall. Yeah, you're six foot six. So, for example, um, the challenge would be finding a bike off the shelf for you. And I think that um, some of the top Canon deals, they've got some big frames. You, you'd need a, a very large frame, at least a 60. You know, you need something because most of the frames off the shelf, as they go bigger, you have longer top tubes. So, if you're six foot six, I mean, it depends on your dimensions. So, chances are you got long arms as well so you need a long top two the biggest thing is we need a bike that is very shallow because at six foot six chances are your femur is very long so we'll need to have a shallow angle most guys your height end up with custom frames because most of the frames that they built they're building them for people maybe up to six two six three you know they don't go much higher than that there's a basketball player named bill walton some of you may know Long time, you know, used to play for the Clippers, San Diego Clippers. And he had to get a custom frame made. And his head tube was this long because he's a big guy. So, yeah, the bigger riders just need the bike to fit them just like we do. It's just that off the shelf. Because six foot six, it's not the everyday height. It's an out, you're, you're an outlier, you know. Kind of like when you have your kid and they say, oh, they're outside the, the ring. Yeah, so six foot six outside the ring. So chances are... If I were to get somebody six foot six, I would probably steer them towards a custom frame. And the custom frame is not going to be any more expensive than this stuff off the shelf. It's all up to what you choose. I didn't pay more for my custom bike than I would pay for a carbon bike off the shelf or even a titanium bike off the shelf. Because the builders know that some riders just need 
custom angles. I got a 70 degree C2 because I have a long femur at 6'2". So for, for you at 6'6", six, six, you'd probably be riding a 70 or something like that, a shallow angle so we can get that saddle under you. It's kind of like stepping back and getting leverage when you're using a tool. That's what that is. That's the challenge. Most of these bikes off the shelf, they're 73. You, you wouldn't be able to ride a 73. I don't care what setback seat post you got at 6'6", six, six, unless most of your 6'6 six, six is the lower part of your leg and not the femur. So you see why our bike sizing is important. All right, let's see here. Um, Miguel Esteban. Which you prefer, blood lactate test with HR or power meter? I, I don't do I don't do any invasive stuff. I mean, you would have to do something like that in a lab if you're going to do a blood lactate test. The heart rate test that I give my people, I have a video that I made where you can tell when you're at threshold because your breathing changes enough. You don't need to prick yourself and test for lactate. You'd have to do that in a lab. That would yeah, that would be the most accurate if you had access to that. But you don't have to do that. Um, power meter is always going to be more accurate as far as the work you're putting out than heart rate because the heart rate has its variability. But it doesn't mean heart rate. You can't train to heart rate. You have to understand the limitations of heart rate. So if I were to choose, I would start with power meter first if the, if the rider can afford it. And then second, heart rate as training tools. And then third, I train everybody I've trained. I, I tell them they need to know how to train by feel. Because if you feel like crap, I don't care what that power meter is saying. That's the day to take it easy. Feel trumps everything. Because you don't want to be going, getting dizzy and then say, well, my power meter says I'm only doing 100 watts. But you're about ready to pass out. You can't ignore that. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's see here. Uh, mm -hmm. Dwayne says he's a Cannondale guard from 2000 to 2020, eight in total. Yeah, I like the dimensions. I like, I like, I like long top tubes on my bikes. They're just stable for, for, for tall guys with long arms. My, my, the length of my arm is about, I think, 34 or something like that. It's pretty long. So, yeah. Um, let's see here. So Fitness Life says, uh, another thing I got, an original Eddie Merck bike would trade up or continue to ride it. I'd keep it. That's a classic. Trade up. What's wrong with it? It's a little heavier than the carbon bikes, but big deal. I ride my Colnago. I've dropped people on my Colnago. You guys see it on film in the group rides. Power is power, man. Yeah, you may not be going maybe a mile an hour faster, but you're still putting out that power. Why do people get dropped? People get dropped because they have not trained their engine to tolerate that effort, okay? So even if you go out with a heavier bike or a bike slightly heavier, I mean, your, your Mercs is probably not even 25 pounds if you weigh it, depending on what wheels you have on this. So if you're going to do anything, change the wheels if you're that worried about it. I don't. I would keep that. The Mercs, they're, they're hard to find. I keep, that, I keep it in mint condition. Yeah, keep it and just change the wheel, lighten the wheels. In fact, I went back. I'm putting uh, tubular wheels on the on the Colnago. It's already on there. They're alloy looking, the polished aluminum. I'm going back to that full retro look on the Colnago. They may not be the fastest wheel, but I love the way they 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 they, they, they fit that period for that bike. So don't worry so much about the weight. It's not it's not the end all of everything. You're not you're not doing a mountain time trial per se. So no, enjoy your bike. You can ride it. You ride anything. I do a lot of training on my Colnago. You know, I, I do group rides on it as well. Don't don't get hung up on just the material. You're not in a world tour event where you're doing the world championship road race that you need to worry about a tenth of a second here and there. So you know, enjoy your bike. Don't go spend any money you don't need to. Adolfo Del Rio, will you get a gravel bike in the future? I don't know. I, I have three bikes that I use. And really, if I, if here's the thing, where I live, you'd have to go out of your way to find gravel roads. The people that ride mountain bikes, I'm sure they have particular trails that they'd have to drive to. We live in Texas. Most of the roads are paved. They don't play in Texas. When they say don't mess with Texas, what they mean is they don't want you throwing trash on the roads. So everything's paved. You see all these little, these crappy roads we ride on, and the next week, 
Oh, you see new pavement. Think about it. These are roads like, like uh, what's it, was it two weeks ago? We went in this little neighborhood. You saw the new pavement that drew us there. That road just led to a neighborhood, and they spent their money to pave it. Texas does not play. So you'd be hard-pressed to go find gravel roads. You'd have to really know the gravel group and find out where the trails are. So, no, I won't be getting a gravel bike because I don't do that much gravel riding. I'm a road guy. you know. And if, if that were the issue, I'd just put bigger tires on the titanium bike. It can take you know like a 28 or something like that. Probably won't take a 32. If I were to do something like that, I'd probably get a road bike that can take a 32, and then I'd use that as a gravel bike. But to buy a specific gravel bike around here, I wouldn't get that much use out of it. You need a road bike here. All our most of our roads are paved. You know they don't play around. They're always resurfacing. You know even though we have chip seal in certain spots, but we have very good roads generally out here. So no. Uh, let's see here. So this guy, S-R-G-A-R-C-E-S, -E I guess it's pronounced Sarces. I don't know if, if I'll skip the two consonants. He said, what do you think about road bicycles from Argon 18? I'm not familiar with them. Let me pull them up while I'm thinking about it. Let's see. I'll pull them up over here on the other screen, Argon 18. Um, you know, nowadays, I mean, unless you're buying something that is totally unknown, like an unbranded thing, and even then, yeah, most of these bikes are probably made in the same factories and just badged per the manufacturer's requirements. Argon 18 bikes. Let's see here. Let me pull it up. So they're starting around 2200 to 5000 generally. They got their own little website. So what, when I'm looking up bikes like this, so what you want to do is you pull it up and you say Argon 18 bikes review. There are quite a few like road.cc. They'll do reviews on some bikes if they get a copy. But that's a good way to kind of check out a new bike that you're not familiar with. See, like Cycling Weekly has a review on the Argon 18 Gallium Pro. You go and you read that review, and then it will give you an idea of, it says, a lightweight bike designed for climbing, but can perform incredibly well on the flat, too. Looks like a standard road bike. Looks pretty decent. I like bikes like that that don't have too much of a slope, too much of an aggressive slope. So... It just looks like everything else out there. I mean, nothing that special. Looks really, if you took the name off, it wouldn't look much different than a Cannondale. So you want to look for, regardless of what is Argon, Cannondale, whatever, if you know what kind of bikes fit you, look at the, the schematics, the specs. What are the dimensions of the bike? How long is the top tube in your size? Is it going to fit you? That's what's more important. Always find a frame that will fit you easily or be close to fitting you because you end up, if you're stuck with a bike, you spend money on it, can't fit you, you're not going to be happy with it. So the cons about the Argon says, this, the reviewer says it was pricey. Then he said the, the, the wheel set was under spec, meaning they put cheap wheel set on it. Then he said it could be more comfortable on long rides. I, that's kind of subjective. It came with Ultegra. He liked that. It was stable, fast, and light. But still, don't, I, I'm not going to put too much stock in that. Just look at the most of these sites. Most of the manufacturers will have the dimensions of the bike. They draw it. They will give you center to center, center to top. They will give you stack height and so forth. So if you've done a bike sizing and they fall in your parameters, then you can put them on your short list. Don't just buy a bike because a pro team uses it or somebody says, great. Make sure it can fit you. So that means you need to know your size first before you shop for bikes. All right. Hope that helps you. Ah, right, Paul's here. Hey, my brother. You yeah, haven't been on the bike since uh, Thursday. Paul and I rode on Thursday evening last week. And since then, we just decided it's gonna be, we're going to rest. So we're resting, and then we're going to start our fall training going forward. I'm going to start tomorrow. Let's see here. Um, um, so here, here's Dwayne. Dwayne says that uh, even though I'm a Canada uh, advanced aluminum design, I test rode a Bianchi steel frame 20 years ago. I've never experienced a ride like that bike yet. It was magical. 
Yeah, I mean, there are some people that just love steel. There are some people that, you know, but it doesn't mean that you can't experiment. Get a little bit of both. Get a steel and get a carbon. Try them out. You never know. And, you know, if you're getting them using, you know your size, you, you don't, you're not outlaying a bunch of cash. So that's kind of cool. Uh, it's good to try it. Somebody named Harry Potter. <laughs> are you the, the Harry Potter or are you just using his name? Because I watched that with my my 21-year-old daughter when she was really into the Harry Potter. I like the, uh, I think the Goblet of Fire or something like that. And then the, the Chamber of Secrets. I just got drawn into that for some reason. I guess I had a slow afternoon, but I really enjoyed those two. It's a good thing. He said, Harry Potter says, uh, hi, found this, just found this channel. I like your style. Well, welcome. That's who I am. And he says, I'm an overweight college student and don't have the funds for your training package. You're an overweight college student. If you were broke, you shouldn't be overweight. <laughs> How are you getting weight? <laughs> I'm just messing with you. I'm serious about getting better. Any tips or free resources VH has? Well, you just need to ride your bike. I hope you got a bike. Um, and then, um, well, you say you're overweight. So that happened over time. Don't dwell on the weight so much because we put on weight and we're not watching it. Then when one day we see that we're overweight or someone says something or whatever, then we go and we start watching it and driving ourselves crazy. Just review what changes to your lifestyle led to you being overweight. Either you were taking more classes, whatever, since you're a college student, or you working and going to school. I mean, I did that when I was in college. And you just have all your time tied up in other things. But make sure that it's important. Recognize that each day belongs to you. So make an appointment with yourself, even if it's just an hour, to work on your health. It's a lot quicker than sitting in a doctor's waiting room. Because all they do is they take you in one waiting room to another waiting room, you know, and then they charge you. So give yourself an hour each day. Start with a walk, short ride, whatever it is, okay? If you're going to ride bikes, then you're going to have to invest in a bike that fits you, or you won't ride as much because it won't be comfortable. And as you drop the weight, you will need to review your fit on that bike. So you're definitely going to have to invest in a bike and invest in a bike fit at a minimum. Just get it to where it's reasonably comfortable and start getting active because that's what that's what causes us to put on weight. We sit around too much, you know. The certain parts of the world, if you go there and you overweight, people come around to find out how you did it. <laughs> because in certain parts of the world, it's not easy to put on weight. <laughs> so, you know, so no, so uh, you don't need to spend a lot, but you need some kind of structure. And so the the, the free advice I can give you is. Just start riding your bike frequently. And then once you get to where you're dropping the weight, then you can really get into something more structured because it's the structure that gets you to drop. I mean, I didn't drop. I didn't go from 93 kilos to 85 kilos in seven months while eating without structure. I just need you to understand that because it's not easy to be motivated and you, you can get burned out if you do too much too soon. So it's important that you have balance. All right, let's see here. Um, <clears throat> Victor Gulen. Victor says, uh, I've been doing brick work workouts. Friend calls us that, not me, where I ride for 45 minutes, then I run for 30 minutes, my average. Speed has increased slightly week by week. Yeah, don't change, don't train by speed. It, it's just it's not uh what can I say? We call it a red herring, meaning that it's it's hard to hang on to. Speed is going to vary. Don't train don't train by speed. Train by effort. Train by the work you're doing. That's why we talk about these tools. Or train by how much work it takes to get you out of breath if you don't have any of those tools. Uh, Luke Holloway, what do you think of the new compact group set? Other than seeing the pictures. Uh, I haven't really given them much of a look because I don't need to carry another card. I already got 11. I only use four. <laughs> so <laughs> I think I assume you're talking about a 12 speed. I'm sure they're nice and slick. In the future, if I were to buy another bike, I would probably get an 11. Why? Because all my stuff is 11. So if you if you get a 12, the, the cool thing about compact, uh, compact though, compact Nolo, is that 
if you were to get a 12, you could use it on an 11 speed, the same hub. That because they made they made the cassettes thinner and it, the chain is thinner or whatever, so it would fit. All you would be changing would probably be the front derailleur and the shifter. Now the reason why the front derailleur is important to change is because when you're dealing with one extra cog, you have a different angle, and so they probably designed that derailleur to allow for no rub. That's why you could probably get away with it, the same existing derailleur. So, so for Campy, yeah, it wouldn't be a big jump to get a 12 speed shifter. It just take, but then I would need 12, 12 speed cassettes. So if I didn't want to spend money on cassettes because I got a bunch of 11 speed cassettes, then I would stay with 11. That's the only thing. They look fine, but don't don't keep up with that. I mean, for the most part, you want to pay attention. If you're just starting out or if you're upgrading and you're going to do 12, just know that you're going to be buying cassette, shifter, and the derailleurs, minimum, and then chain, the drivetrain, okay? That, that's your main change there. But you're carrying one more cog. I don't know. I mean, I know people who ride 10-speed, 9-speed. I could ride 8-speed and be fine. Most of the rides we do, I'm in the 53. I ride the 5321 to the 5314. Let's see. So 21, 19, 15, 17. <laughs> no, let's see. 20, let's see. 21, 19, 17, 16, 15. So five gears. That's what I use most of the time. Now, it doesn't mean that when I go to the small chain ring, I don't go to the 14 and so forth. But what I mean is for most of the time when I'm on the big chain ring, I'm between the 15 to the 21 in the area I ride in. So five, So there are six cogs that I just carry around most of the time. Yeah, and everybody, you know, you don't use all of them. But yeah, but when you do need that little extra, the 20, 25 or the 27, it's nice to have it there. Or if you need the 12 or the 11 on that downhill, it's nice to have it there. So don't get hung up on that one extra cog. It's not going to make that big of a difference. But if you're in the market, then yes, it's always good to get the latest. But just know what you're going to be dealing with. All right, let's see here. Um, Dwayne says, Argon 18s are some nice looking bike, but super expensive. See, I don't like that phrase, Dwayne. I don't like the word super expensive. I don't like the word expensive because it's relative. Think about it. What's expensive? What's expensive for me? Maybe peanuts for the next guy. What's peanuts for the next guy might be, you know, crazy. So don't say that. All the person needs is, oh, I like it because of these features. Then they have to decide whether it fits what they want to spend. Because when you tell someone, if I tell you something's expensive, how do I know? I don't, I'm not in your wallet. <laughs> how do I know? I should say it's expensive for me <laughs> because I'm in my wallet. So like, we got to start doing that. If you're going to use the word expensive, just say it's super expensive for me. It's outside my budget. I'm not willing to spend that on a road bike. That makes more sense because it varies. I always like to tell people when I do the reviews, that's why I don't talk about prices. I introduce products to the channel. You want to check it out? You'll find out what it costs when, it, when you get there. And then you can decide if you want to, to, to incur the expense and experience that. It's kind of like somebody telling me about a restaurant, man. They got this great uh, uh, oolong sea bass or whatever. Then they tell me, but it's expensive. That's like an insult. What the hell do you mean it's expensive? You don't know what I'm willing to spend to try something decadent. <laughs> you know, delicate. You know, I, I, well, decadent is not the right word. Something uh, uh, delicate or, you know, just have that experience to treat myself. Even think about it. Some of us will spend a month's salary on stuff. It doesn't have to be bike related or whatever, you know, whether it's a car or whatever. You know, think about it. They make Ferraris. That's like me telling somebody, oh, the Ferrari is nice, but it's expensive. No, maybe it's not for me. <laughs> you know, but there's a market for it. But it doesn't mean there's something wrong with the product. So it's good to at least savor the product, maybe even walk around the dealership, look at it sit in it or whatever. You don't have to buy it, but at least you say, oh yeah, that's a nice car, but it's not for me. That's the way. So yeah, don't, don't be telling people things expensive. It's expensive for me. That's the way I like the role. All right, let's do this. John Rito, where are you living in Houston when Campbell had the warehouse just of the 610 West Loop? 
I don't know what year it was, but I've been in Houston since 83. So chances are, yeah, I was in Houston. I did my uh, undergraduate here in Houston and uh, my master's in uh, Austin. So yeah, I've been, I've been, Houston is home, been here for a long time. I was not familiar with the campy warehouse. I, you know, I just rode bikes. And at that time, probably in the late eighties, early nineties, I didn't pay for bike stuff. They were giving us stuff to race. So yeah. So Simeon, Simeon Alex says, do you have a dedicated mm -hmm. spare wheel for your cycle ops trainer? Uh, no, I don't. I have a tire. <laughs> well, I guess I said tires. I know what you mean. I don't have a trainer tire. I don't believe in that because the quality of those tires, then you're stuck. You can't use them on the road. So I use uh, the uh, Continental Ultra Sport tire or Continental Gator Skin tire, 28 millimeter. That's what I use on my trainers. I sometimes even use the 4000 S 25 millimeter on my trainer. I have found that, that my trainer is not chewing up those tires. That's really what you want to use to base your decision. Don't spend the money to buy a trainer tire. Buy a tire you can use on a trainer and take on the road. Stretch your dollars that way. I have used the Ultra Sport for more than a, a year. And then you look at it, you can't even tell. The trainer just, because it's a low TPI tire, I think it's like 120 something or whatever. Don't use a racing tire on your trainers. They're, they're softer. They're, they're, um, they're supple. And the trainer will, will, will wear them quicker. Use, use training tires. Use low TPI. It's so 100 to 150 TPI thereabouts on your trainer. Your training tire is good enough. You don't need a special wheel. If you have an old beat-up wheel that you want to use for that, that's fine. But then if you can use it on the trainer, you should also be able to ride on the road. So I just put a tire on there for training, and I use it on a trainer on the road. So all I do is I swap 